uh, today, turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And we're going to continue our study through the book of Acts. Today's message is, He Eatons to the Rescue. He Eatons to the Rescue. Now, between chapter 5 and chapter 6, almost four years have gone by. I know we read the Bible, we think uh, everything's just flowing uh, from one minute to the next, but about four, almost four years have passed by the time we get to chapter number 6. So the idea of the early church where many miraculous signs were happening, people were selling their property and giving it to a communal um, Church, treasure chest, if I put it that way, um, that's all past. That's all gone. Uh, and we'll see that in just a moment. Um, so Pilate is reaching the end of his uh, reign. Uh, he was recalled by the emperor back to Rome. Um, I believe in modern vernacular, we call it, he got fired. Um, but he became more and more tyrannical as he got closer to the end of his reign. Uh, in fact, at one point, he raided the temple tax. Remember that uh, every uh, Jew, uh, every Israelite had to take um, two coins um, and put them in the treasury. And if you recall, Jesus was standing by the treasury, you remember, watching people put their offerings in. But by law, by the law of Moses, to support the temple, uh, people had to put, all people put in the same amount in this one particular offering. So he robbed that and built an aqueduct uh, to bring water into the city. And then he began to put statues of the emperor throughout the city of Jerusalem, which of course was an abomination to the Jews. Um, so I said all that to say this. If you're wondering, well, for four years, the church was really snowballing. I mean, it was growing by the thousands. It was becoming organized, and things were happening. And why did the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, which were the, the, ruling, the rulers of the nation, why weren't they doing something? Because in the first few chapters, they were calling the disciples in, and they were... Uh, first of all, they told them, don't teach in the name of Jesus anymore, and they threatened them. Second time, they beat them. Third time, we're going to find out they wanted to kill them. And Gamaliel, we, we talked about this Wednesday night, said, listen, if this work is of God, uh, you're not going to stop it. If it's of men, then it'll just come to nothing, and they decide, okay, we won't kill them, and they just beat them and send them out. Now, why did, why did they not continue that? Well, because of what was happening politically in their country, particularly in Jerusalem, uh, with Pilate and all that he was doing, and Rome was becoming more and more oppressive. Uh, until finally, uh, as you know, uh, Israel revolted in the late 60s, and the Roman army came and, and destroyed the city and the temple in 70 AD. So, their minds were on politics, not on the church. In their mind, the church was just a sect of Judaism in which, and you'll know it if you read the beginning of the book of Acts, they were simply saying, don't teach in this man's name. In fact, they even said, why do you want to bring this man's blood upon us? So it was the name of Christ. In other words, that they were claiming he was the Messiah, and, of course, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin were saying, no, he's not the Messiah. But everything else was the same. They still went to the temple. They still followed the law of Moses. They were still very Jewish. Now, today, of course, Christianity and Judaism are <coughs> poles apart. But back in the beginning of the church, they were poles apart. It was just Judaism that said, okay, Jesus now is our Messiah. And these people were saying, no, he's not but everything else remained the same for a, a, a length of time. Now things are starting to separate. So here we get to chapter number six. We discovered that there's a conflict now in the church, which is a whole lot different than chapter two, 
where everybody had all things common and they were all singing kumbaya and everything was lovey-dovey, now conflict arises. Have you ever noticed there's conflict in life? In fact, if you don't have any conflict in your life, I'm not sure you're living a normal life. There's conflict in life, and we see that conflict comes into uh, the church here. Um, nobody that I know likes conflict. <coughs> or confrontation that comes along with trying to resolve the conflict. In fact, I believe a lot of times in churches, people chicken out, and instead of trying to resolve conflict with somebody in the church, they just leave. Because it's easier to just leave than to face somebody and say, you offended me, or you were wrong, or you hurt me. You really could use stronger language, but we won't. You're a jerk. <laughs> Things like that. You rubbed me the wrong way. So we tend to not want to confront people. Nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to be ordered by the IRS, right? Nobody likes to confront people. Nobody likes confrontation. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, we avoid confrontation. I recall reading this, and maybe you've heard this before, but in 1919, Lady uh, Nancy Astor became the first woman in the House of Commons in uh, England. And she was known for her biting tongue and her quick wit. And her equal in that department was Winston Churchill. And their personalities clashed. They hated each other. And if, after one contentious uh, session in Parliament, um, Nancy Astor said, Winston, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your coffee. <laughs> and Winston came right back and said, Nancy, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> So we get to chapter number six. Notice verse number one. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Let's pray. So here the early church had obviously conflict and the conflict was racial. So the Jews that spoke Hebrew were opposed to the Jews that only spoke, it says Grecian here, my translation, but those that were residents of Palestine, the Samaritans, those that uh, came from elsewhere, uh, those that were uh, steeped in the, the Greek culture, uh, they spoke either Greek or Aramaic, and so, and Jesus, by the way, spoke Aramaic as well. So there was this contention there was always that contention. There was always that, well, you know, what's the matter with those Jews? Why don't they speak Hebrew? When I went to uh, school, uh, in fact, uh, the ninth grade, and then 10th grade we went into the high school building, um, my uh, community that I grew up with was uh, a large Jewish population, and kids right after school would go to Hebrew school. So they get out of school, they walk across the street to the temple, and they learn Hebrew. So back in those days, the people that spoke Hebrew were kind of proud and said, we speak Hebrew, it's better to speak Hebrew. And you that speak Greek and you don't know Hebrew, you're not as good as us. So there was tension. That tension came into the church. So when they got saved or they accepted Christ as their savior, they brought that pride or arrogance into the church. By the way, it worked in both directions. So the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and trust me, the Samaritans didn't like the Jews at the same time. So uh, there's this contention. So there has to be a solution. Now, here's what Joseph uh, Alexander writes. He says, the whole class of foreign or Greek-speaking Jews as distinguished from the Hebrews or natives of Palestine and others who used the Hebrew scriptures and spoke the Aramaic dialect, between these races there was no doubt constant jealousy or emulation. 
although no real difference of faith or practice. This party spirit may seem to have been carried with them into the Christian church on their conversion. And I believe that. So a person that's a racist and they become a Christian, well, that's baggage that comes into the Christian life that they have to overcome. And of course, all of us have baggage of some sort as we come into the Christian life. But notice verse number one here. I want to show you something. And that is this. That this verse confirms that there's no absolute community of goods here any longer. So in chapter 2, when people are selling their property or their homes, and they're bringing the money to the apostles, and they're saying, here you go, just distribute it to those in need, notice that there's no place here where these people can just go and get food. So why did the Greek widows just go and get food at the common table? Because it wasn't happening any longer. So we understand that a change has taken place over these past four years. Then verse number two. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. Now, notice what we have here is that church government is now coming into play. So before it was strictly the apostles teaching and preaching the multitudes, generally in the temple and house to house. Now what happens is a conflict comes up. There's a problem in the church. We have to resolve this problem. So the disciples decided, or the apostles decided, in verse 4, we shall give ourselves continually to prayer and in the ministry of the word. So we feel that Christ told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel, or actually preach the gospel, teach all people, make disciples of them, and baptize them. We don't want to take the time to do this practical aspect of the church life. So you choose out seven men, and they'll take care of this issue. So now we have organization coming into the church. So the apostle said, we will stick to the spiritual side of things and the practical outworking of the church, the day-to-day -day life of the church that happens here in this world. We're going to give to these seven men. Now notice he says here, um, in verse number three, it says, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, in my thinking, they chose seven men because how many days a week do you eat? Seven days a week. Seven days a week. So I believe one of each of these men was in charge of a particular day. And I think they took that from the work in the temple. That was on a rotating basis. So people that came and ministered in the temple, it happened on a rotating basis. So I think the same idea. So one, one of these deacons would take Monday, the other would take Tuesday, so on and so forth. Now notice they're over this business. So I don't believe that in the city of Jerusalem where there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, that one man ran around to all the houses or took care of all the people that came if in fact there was a table set up someplace that they came to the table by the hundreds each day and one person was doing all the work. I believe that the person in charge got help. Do I think that they then went home and sat down and said, there, I delegated it, and so I'm, I'm done. No, I believe it was hands-on. I believe the deacons did the hands-on work, but they had hands that helped them do their hands-on work. So they were over the business, but I believe they were also involved in making sure it took place properly. Remember, they had to resolve the problem. If they just hired, if I just hired Gary, and he's a deacon, by the way, if I just hired Gary and Dennis um, and said, okay, you two guys, on Mondays, you two guys go to the table and make sure that all the widows get the food that they need, and then I go home. 
How do I know that they're not still just giving food to the Hebrew widows and not the Greek widows? You say, well, they probably would have picked. Oh no, the church already picked the spiritual guys. So I'm thinking, okay, is he only going to pick spiritual guys? Probably so, but not necessarily so. Just going to pick people willing to help, people willing to sacrifice time. So they were over the business, but I believe they were hands-on in the business as well. Um, so they have these deacons now. Because the Bible tells us in verse number 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen. And by the way, this is the backstory of the stoning of Stephen, which happens in verse number 8 that we're not going to cover today. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, uh, and uh, Prochorus, and Nacorn, uh, no, Nacorn, uh, I'll get it, Nicanor, and Taman, and Tarmenius, and Nicholas, and a, who is a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of, and you can underline this next word, a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So now some of the priests were starting to accept Jesus and Messiah, which I believe was really the nail in the coffin, so to speak, when the ruling class said, we really got to clamp down on this church now. We have to do something about it. And it begins with the stoning of Stephen. Now, let me give you a heads up because we're going to cover this Wednesday night. If you recall... When the Romans controlled the city or the nation, you weren't allowed to put people to death. That's why the Jewish leadership brought Jesus to Pilate. Only Pilate can condemn somebody to death under Roman law. And yet, they stoned Stephen. Why? What's the difference? Well, here's the difference. Because Pilate was called back to Rome and nobody knew had showed up yet. So in the interim, there's a little disconnect here, politically speaking, and they utilize that opportunity to kill somebody, which normally they couldn't do. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Because I know you had that question in your, your mind when you're reading through Act. You say, hey, how come they couldn't, couldn't kill Jesus, but they killed Stephen because there's a political turmoil going on in Rome. All right. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. So they, they voted on seven guys. And I, 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 believe, I mean, there's differences of opinions, but I believe the most logical one is one man was over each day and then the same day each week. <clears throat> so the apostles said, here's the criteria for these men. Now, as the church developed, obviously, Paul, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, got more criteria for the deacons. We're going to look at that. But first, we're going to look at the criteria or the qualifications of the pastor. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a pastor, and Timothy is going to ordain other men to be pastors and deacons, and this is the instruction. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, don't forget, bishop, pastor, elder, all the same position. I know this church would say, well, there's a group of elders and they control. No, no, no. We believe the pastor is the under-shepherd, Christ the head of the church, the pastor of the under-shepherd. The deacons were brought into the church for the reason of what? Servicing, Servicing who? Yeah. Widows. That's why the first deacons were brought into the church, servicing the widows. So I believe to this very hour, one of the main considerations of the deacons is, how are the widows doing in our church? Do they live alone? 
Do they have enough to eat? Are they living only on Social Security? By the way, I already suggested this. I think the church ought to take widows that are living on Social Security and give them a check. You say, that's unheard of. Yes, it is unheard of. But I think it's normal. You say, well, they have children that can support them. We're talking about widows in need. Widows who don't have anybody to help them and they're living on Social Security. Now, I know our current president is going to give us all a big raise in Social Security, but unfortunately, I'd rather have prices remain the same and don't give you the raise in Social Security. Because Social Security is never going to catch up to inflation. So, if a man desires the office of a bishop or pastor, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. You don't vote somebody in to be the pastor of a church that you can point blame to. He's a thief. He's a liar. He owes money over here. He's no good. I see him down at the bar all the time, stumbling out the front door at 2 o'clock in the morning. Blameless. Perfect? No. But blameless? Yes. Number two, the husband of one wife. I believe they were addressing polygamy in those days. Because men would marry. In fact, that's one of the major issues when you convert somebody in an Islamic nation and they have more than one wife. What's the, what's the Christian man now do with all those other wives? Ah, we don't have that problem here. You say, Pastor, what's the solution? The solution is we don't have that problem here. <laughs> That's the solution. So the husband of one wife, I know some people say that uh, a man that's divorced, um, if he gets remarried, he has another wife. Well, there's a scriptural reason to get divorced, uh, fornication, adultery. And so if you legally get, I'm talking spiritually here, legally get uh, divorced and you get remarried, then I believe that man can be a pastor. Now, if he's been married five times and he just divorces women and remarries women, that, that's a character problem, maybe. So, anyway, so I believe you're dealing with polygamy here. So the husband of one wife, or the literal Greek translation, it is a one-woman man. Mm. He must be vigilant, sober, that means sober-minded. He must be of good behavior, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. My version says, must be pretty good behavior. Good behavior. Given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine. Not a striker. In other words, a brawler. Somebody that's willing to, uh, you know, take care of confrontation the way I did in ninth grade. Pow! I noticed, too, when you hit somebody, they always hit back. Not good. So, uh, not a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. In other words, not greedy of money. And of course, there's a warning about money uh, throughout the scripture. Not, uh, but patient, not a brawler. That kind of goes along with a striker, but not a brawler. Uh, in other words, somebody that does an argumentative. You ever meet somebody that you know always escalates to an argument? You have a problem. And not a covetous, in other words, uh, constantly desiring, you know, a new jet. I don't want a new jet. I'm satisfied with a used jet. That was a joke. I'm just satisfied with a Piper Cup. A helicopter. I'm satisfied with what I've got. Not covetous. One that rules his own house. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. Why? Because if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Good point. Does that mean his kids are perfect? Well, I, I confess to you publicly, my kids are not perfect. Are your kids perfect? I don't think so. You may think so, but they're not perfect. And I can tell you, when you know they're not perfect, when they're 14, 15, 16, and 17, all of a sudden, all that cuteness kind of fades away. So, uh, 
Number six. Verse number six. Not a novice. Not somebody that just got saved. Not somebody that's new to the, to the uh, faith. Lest being filled up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. So I met a man at college after I was done preaching. He said, uh, church is going to hire me as soon as I graduate college. I thought, wow, that's, that's exciting, you know. And I said to him, oh, well, so you have an interim in your church. An interim for four years is a long time to have an interim pastor. But the, apparently they, they've agreed to that. But the Bible tells us you don't take somebody that's brand new. So fortunately, and this happened in a class when I was in Bible college, a church hired a student, a, a fellow student in my class after two years of Bible college and said, we want you to be the pastor. So he quit Bible college and became the pastor. Even back then, I was thinking, that's probably not a good idea. Of course, I was older than many of the classmates. But um, so this, this kid, you know, was probably 19, 20 years old and uh, it becomes the pastor. I said, he probably should finish college. And he didn't. He became the pastor because the church wanted him. So we want you to be the pastor. We don't like our old pastor. We want you to be the pastor. You know what it reminded me of? You lost your boyfriend and you got a new boyfriend. And what's that new boyfriend called? You got him on the rebound. The rebound. Thank you. You got him on the rebound. It's not like you really wanted another boyfriend, but he'll do because I'm feeling bad about the broken relationship. So they got this kid on the rebound to me. You say, was it a happy ending? No, it was not a happy ending. So he lasted there, I think, about a couple of years, and then out he went. Not a novice. Doesn't mean you can't hire somebody out of college. At least they have four years of being trained in understanding scripture and sitting under the authority of men um, who gave their wisdom to them. Not a novice. Um, moreover, you must have a good report of them which are without or outside the church. Imagine that. Not just, hey, he's a good guy on Sunday. What's his reputation outside the church? Is he paying his bills? Is he a drunk outside the church? You know, grape juice in the church, wine outside the church, whiskey, brandy. Remember, God said, give strong drink to those that are dying. So, no morphine for me. <laughs> brandy. <laughs> brandy. So, not somebody that has a bad report of them which are outside the church, lest they fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So twice it mentions the snare of the devil, the condemnation of the devil. So those are the criteria or the qualifications for a, a pastor. But notice right after that, likewise, must the deacons be grave. So uh, obviously the whole idea of this Pastor being sober-minded means he's grave. In other words, there is uh, an understanding. This is important. Now, you know me. I joke around sometimes. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm dead serious. In the point that you need to be saved. So I want to make sure that you have an understanding that unless you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for your soul... You will die in a Christless eternity. I'm dead serious about that. I'm dead serious about the Bible being the Word of God. It's infallible. It was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to men who wrote the exact words that the Holy Spirit wanted them to write. It was not dictation. He used their vocabulary. He used their personality. He used everything about these individuals so they wrote it in their own style, with their own vocabulary, but the very words that the Holy Spirit wanted them to write. So in verse number uh, eight, like what? The deacons must be great, not double-tongued. So uh, obviously not gossip, not given to much wine. Notice it does say not given to any wine. The idea is that you're not to be influenced by the wine itself, but influenced by the Holy Spirit. Not given to much wine, 
Not greedy of filthy lucre, same thing, that old dirty money. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. So in other words, that the faith or the teachings of Christianity are held in high esteem and are apt to be taught by these men if need be. And let, oh, a pure conscience. So the idea being that obviously they're not in it for the money, they're not in it for the prestige, they're in it because they're there to serve God and serve the people that are in that church and in the early church, the widows particularly. Verse 10, and let these also be first proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So in other words, not a novice, let them be proved. So we're not just going to pick somebody. I grew up in a church where every year you voted for a new deacon. They were on a rotating basis. So you always voted for uh, two men, I believe, each year. And then you served for three years, if I'm not mistaken. And so every year, you know, okay, who are we going to get this year? Oh, you know, he was already deacon. Who are we going to And after a while, because you have to pick somebody, all of a sudden you're not looking at qualifications anymore. You're looking for a warm body. Know what I mean? To me, deacons are for life. There's only two ways you can't be a deacon. Number one, you get fired. Number two, you die. That's it. You die. Now, can they resign? Sure, they could say, I don't want to be a deacon anymore. We've had deacons do that. Um, they're not alive anymore. They've passed away. So just, just be careful, deacons. Somebody that you know and I know said, I don't want to be a deacon anymore. Now they're not with us anymore. Just kidding. They were there. So there's qualifications, but it goes on here. First they be proved, let them then be found, um, to use the office of the deacon being found blameless, even so must their wives be grave. Notice it said nothing about the pastor's wives. You say, why would they mention the wives? Well, how many think that wives can influence their husband? How many think wives do influence their husbands? How many husbands think your wife influences you? You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> Even so, the wives are to be grave, not slanderers. In other words, not a gossip. Not talking ill of other people in the church. Sober-minded, faithful in all things. So this is, this is an important position. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, that they gain much confidence and freedom and boldness in the faith. It's an important position. It's a necessary position. Now, many churches can function without deacons, and deacon boards uh, tend to fall away from really uh, what Scripture is teaching us hands-on, over the affairs of the church, taking care of people in the church. Now, granted, in the New Testament age, there was no social security. And if a widow had no family, there was no income whatsoever. So the church was definitely obligated to take care of them. But I believe the church ought to be obligated to take care of and watch out for the widows in the church. And we've got several. You don't have to raise your hand, you know who you are. So we should be obligated to do that. We should have a concern for those women. We should all be praying for them. By the way, they face a situation that you don't. And of course, the number one problem would be, of course, loneliness right after they lose their spouse. So obviously, as a church, we should be contacting them. Now, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I have visited our widow, but I, I'm not comfortable with just going to a woman's house by myself, and it's just me and her. I do it, I've done it, 
But I think some of you all, y'all, should call up and visit and invite them over and things like that. It shouldn't just be, well, the pastor will take care of them. Yes, and this is part of taking care of them, talking about it. So don't forget the women in our church, except for Garrett. You got no problem. <laughs> So uh, the early church is on its way to fully functioning. It's becoming um, organized, but I want to end with this thought. The church is not an organization, though it's organized in respect. Of course, we've got our statement of faith, etc. We've got you know, pastors in charge of this, deacons in charge of that, treasurer, all that, church secretary. That's or organizational. And I believe that's scriptural. The Bible says, do all things decently and in order. That's why I believe in membership. I don't believe in just, you know, everybody can just come. Well, then who's the Christian? Who's not a Christian? How do we minister to people at different spiritual levels? So the point being that we are organized, but the church is an organism. It's a living, breathing body of Christ. And Christ, of course, is the head of the church. The life's blood, if you will, is the working of the Holy Spirit within the church, within your heart and my heart. Obviously, also it's hard is the mandate to make disciples. We need to be discipling people, finding somebody, putting them under our wing. All right. So what's the functionality of the members? Well, how does the church function? We know that the head of the church is Christ, and of course it's life's blood, if you will, the Holy Spirit working through the church, and the heart of the church is to win people to Christ and disciple them. But what's the practical outworking? I mean, the day-to-day, -day, we got to eat food, and people need to oil. Hey, does anybody know the price of oil we on recently? Yeah. But let me say this publicly. If you have problems this winter, paying your oil bill. I don't mean that you're wasting money. I mean that you're really hard pressed. You know, it's a choice between food or oil. Then let me know and we will help. So anyway, the functionality of the church is truly the members using their gifts and their abilities to help each other. That's why we're here. That's why God puts us together. He puts you in a family. What's the family for? To help you to minister to you, to grow you up as a kid so that your parents can impart on you some wisdom and some skill, etc., etc. Same with the church. How do, I, how do I stay encouraged in my faith? You know, it's tough out there. People, you know, people bullying me because I'm a Christian. They pass over me. I didn't get my, my uh, promotion at work because the boss knows I'm a Christian. He doesn't like that. People have problems. So we come to church. You hear a sermon, you sing some songs, that's good, but it's way more than that. We need one-on-one -on -one sometimes. Your strength.